let's go ahead and get going. Everybody's, uh, you know, an interesting time. We're so excited to have everybody here. Uh, welcome to what every communicator needs to know about TikTok and, and perhaps some things that you don't need to know about it, but we're going to uncover anyway for you. Uh, my name is Andy Conti. I'm the director of the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University, and we're pleased to be co-sponsoring today's event with PRSA Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us as we dive into the growing social media network of TikTok to hear from industry experts on best practices and insights. I'm gonna suggest that as we go along, if you wanna drop your questions and comments into the, the chat function, uh, that should be turned on and I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, that way we can have more of an interactive conversation rather than just having you sit there and listen the whole time. Also, before we get started, I wanna take a moment to thank our graduate assistant, Stacy. Uh, she actually had the idea for this program more than a year ago before the pandemic, and we had planned to do something in person. Uh, instead, of course, we're on Zoom, like you've been doing for the last year. Uh, and I want to mention this not only because Stacy is graduating, graduating next month and actively looking for her next job opportunity. So for all of those, those of you who are out there doing hiring or might have an opening coming up, Stacy's your girl, uh, but also because she's been a total rock star for us. Uh, and in the context of today's discussion, she says that she's actually up for talking with anyone about TikTok on LinkedIn. So um, we'll be sure to include all of her contacts in the uh, the chat so you know how to reach her. And we're just grateful to have her here. She's She's been with us uh, for three years getting uh, a dual master's degree. So we're going to be sorry to see her go. Before we get into today's topic and, uh, you know, we introduce all the speakers, I do want to introduce Nellie Tokley, who's going to cover some of the PRSA chapter news. Yeah, thanks so much, Andy. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining uh, taking some time out of your day to um, join us and talk about TikTok and learn about it. Um, on behalf of PRSA Pittsburgh, I have a few chapter announcements. Just wanted to go through uh, my programs co-chair, Emily Stock, will drop um, quick high-level blurbs in the Zoom chat here. Um, as, as always, just reach out to anyone on the board uh, with any questions on anything. Um, first off, um, PRSA Pittsburgh, it seems for Public Relations Society of America, we're the Pittsburgh chapter, of course. Uh, you don't even have to be a public relations professional. Um, a lot of our members, uh, this is a global organization, are in digital marketing, social media, PR, all things in between. So um, we welcome you with open arms. New members this month can sign up and get a free sectional membership up to a $65 value. Um, go to prsa.org for info on how to sign up. And the sectional memberships are just uh, the community you want to be in. If you're working, say, in corporate comms, um, nonprofit, government, education, and so forth, there to join. A really great way to expand your network. Uh, there's a, a private job bank on the PRSA website for members. Uh, lots of networking events, uh, you know, over the phone and Zoom in person, hopefully in the next few months. So um, again, reach out to us if you do have any questions on joining. Um, also, National PRSA has an in-between jobs program. You just go to prsa.org backslash in between. Uh, use the code in between when you register for more uh, networking job opportunities. Our Pittsburgh chapter is National Women's Month by honoring our uh, female mentors. So if you're a member and have female mentor you want to give a shout out to and share some info on how this person has contributed to your career and your education, uh, again, reach out to us at info at prsa-pgh.org and uh, you'll have a chance to be featured in blog posts and social media posts very soon. Um, we yeah. also- oh, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll get oh, we also have a, um, an RFP out for um, nonprofits in the Pittsburgh Metroplex to um, get some free PR and social media help this year. We're looking for an organization to partner with and provide our services. Um, so if you know of a nonprofit or if you're with a nonprofit that needs some PR and social media help, please have them apply. Uh, go to our website for information. Deadline is April 9. And last but not least, we have an event tomorrow with our Young Professionals Committee. Uh, if you're not a young professional, you're still welcome to join. It's going to feature um, WTAE anchor Chris Lovingood from Pittsburgh. The event is free and open to the public. Go to the PRSA Pittsburgh Facebook page around 1230 Eastern tomorrow to join in. That's all I got. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nellie. I appreciate it. 
thanks for covering all that. And uh, again, again, thanks to PRSA for joining with the, the Center for Media Innovation for on today's show. So let's get going about TikTok. Uh, I'm going to introduce our three panelists, but I have to warn you in advance that one of these is not like the others. And uh, you're going to have to, you can judge it as we go through them. But uh, let me start out with Heather Starfiedler, uh, Dr. Starfiedler, who has a dual appointment in the School of Communication in the Department of Community Engagement, which she chairs. For the Department of Community Engagement, she serves as director of the PhD in Community Engagement Program, as well as the First Year Experience Program. Her work focuses on university community partnerships and helping serve basic needs for the community. In the School of Communication, she focuses on new and emerging media technology and social media. In addition, she serves as director of Wood Street Communications, the university's nonprofit outreach program. So I've kind of set the standard there with that first one. Uh, Sloan Kelly. Welcome, Sloan. We're happy to have you here. Uh, she leads the social media team at Nine Rooftops, where she's responsible for the strategic direction and implementation of social media programs. A storyteller at heart, Sloan has been producing content for more than 15 years, and she specializes in bringing content to life across social platforms. Sloan previously spent eight years on the brand side, where she built social media and content strategies for the PGA Tour and the United States Tennis Association. Last but not least by any measure, Connor Clyde, otherwise known as Mr. Helia Girl on TikTok. Connor describes himself as, quote, just a hot dude doing hot things. This Pittsburgher likes to think of himself as a young evil Knievel mixed with a little bit of Mission Impossible's Ethan Hunt. He lives an outlaw life with no place to truly call home. The closest thing that he can call family is a set of wheels on his feet. That's right, he's talking about his beloved Heelys. Between them and his close friends, Labu, Fergie and George Michael, they're really all he's got. If you're looking to sit back, laugh, cry, and get inspired, you've landed in the right place when you see this hot dude doing hot things on TikTok. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get to that. I'm actually a little hot and bothered uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Healy, but um, we're actually gonna start out with Heather uh, to give us a rundown on TikTok and, and go over uh, you know, the platform and give us some tips on how to use it. And then we'll get to uh, our two other panelists. So. Heather? Thank you. I'm going to be way less exciting than Connor. I apologize in advance. Um, before I get started, I would love to see um, sort of a digital show of hands using your reactions button, either, you know, the, the clapping or the thumbs up or the heart or any of those reactions. How many of you have created and posted a TikTok video of your own? Heather, I have posted a TikTok video. I wanted to let you know. Okay, uh, thank you, Connor. I wasn't sure. <laughs> no, no problem. Great, okay. So good. Um, it seems like some have, but a lot haven't, which is uh, good for my talk because I was asked to talk a little bit about just sort of the platform in general and a basic idea of how to use it and why we might use it, a little bit of the history. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a, um, a quick PowerPoint. I promise to stay on time today. Um, can you let me know if you're seeing the PowerPoint presentation or all the slides? We got it. Okay. Perfect. So, um, just to give you a little bit of a background about hit, uh, TikTok. It, as most of you know, it's a video platform uh, site where people are creating some really creative content and sharing it um, with the users on TikTok. And right now, TikTok, ha TikTok has about 80 million monthly active users, and they skew a little bit more female than male. But the one thing that I think is the most important for all of us to think about is the age range of TikTok. So right now, TikTok is about 86% young people's game uh, between 16 and 44. But the biggest percentage of TikTok users is that sort of coveted 16 to 24 age group. So there are, you know, the, the question I think for brands and um, people in general is like, should we use it? Is it a good return on our investment? And the answer to that can be yes or no depending on how much um, time and energy, how much time and energy you you have to put into it and whether or not that's the demographic that you're looking to reach so um, TikTok videos are very similar to the other short video sites that we saw in the past, like Vine, 
Uh, they can be three to 60 seconds long. They can use the native sound of the originally created video, pick a pre-recorded sound um, from a, a nice library of sounds or upload um, somebody's own sound or a voiceover on top of a video. I'm gonna talk just a little today about how to actually create a TikTok video and, um, and edit one. So if you have never done it and you wanna follow along and you have it on your phone or your device, uh, I'm gonna spend just a minute or two going through um, the basic kind of creation strategy for creating your own TikTok video. So I put a couple screenshots in here for you to see what, what you would see if you don't have it downloaded on your screen, but it's really quite simple. And I am not in that demographic and I am not a huge TikTok user personally or professionally, I should say. I use it personally for fun, but I tend to be more of a, a consumer of the videos as opposed to a creator. But creating a video, even for my 48 year old self was really, really very simple. So all you have to do is open your TikTok, create an account, Look for the little plus sign, just like you would on Instagram and lots of other social media sites um, and click on a sound so you can add a sound that's already in the website or in the library of sounds. And there's lots of great music there, or you can just use the native sound from the video you create. And when you're ready to record your video, there's a nice big red button to hit to record. And you can either record one long stream of a video by clicking and letting go or clicking and holding it with your finger, or you can create little snippets of video. And that's where you see in TikTok videos where people are jumping from sort of scene to scene. TikTok makes it really easy for you to do that by just pressing and holding and letting go and pressing and holding and letting go. You can flip your camera uh, so that you could have something, a video of yourself, but then mixing that up with videos of what's uh, going on around you. And you tap and hold the video as many times as you want until you get to your maximum number of seconds for your video and you'll see the clips along the top of your screen kind of filling up that timeline. Once you've created some clips, you're gonna see the options on the right-hand side for things like the speed of the video. So you can create it at the natural, you know, one time speed or you can make it faster. You'll see filters. You'll see this wonderful beautify option to make yourself look a little nicer. You can set up a timer so you don't have to hold it the whole time if you're not actually uh, able to kind of touch your phone. And then you'll also see uh, on the next screen, you'll see things like filters where you can add backgrounds um, to your video. You can adjust each of your clips so you can shorten them if you want to. You can rearrange them if you want to. You can add voice effects. You can add a voiceover. It's all really very simple. Um, by just touching these various um, menu items and playing around with them. So, uh, and at the bottom, you'll see there's an option for effects and sounds. Um, and then you just keep going at the very bottom right-hand corner of the screen when you're done with everything that's in there, hitting next, and it'll take you to the next set of options. And when you hit next again, you'll get to the option where you're ready to post your video. When you're ready to post your video, you can add a caption for your video, which is recommended along with any hashtags. And TikTok makes it really easy. They'll suggest hashtags for you, or you can type in your own. And you can also tag friends in this um, window as well. Then you can pick whether or not you want to add comments. Sometimes you may, sometimes you may not. And uh, whether you want to add something called duet. So duet is where your video would be available for other people to do a duet, which is where you may have seen kind of a side by side where I could sing along with somebody who's singing and it would look like we're doing it kind of together um, or trying a new dance move with somebody else's video. If I don't want people to be able to do that with my videos, I would leave that duet off. Um, if I want people to be able to do it, you can turn that on. Uh, it's really that simple and you can select a cover image for your video and then you post it and it takes a few seconds and you've got your very first TikTok video. So uh, the first time I played around with TikTok, it was a matter of just clicking each of the options and seeing what they did and playing around with it. I set my first video to private so that I was the only one that could see it because I didn't really want everybody to see myself learning how to use TikTok. So you can always do that as you're learning and don't feel like you're going to post it for the whole world to see. I actually find TikTok to be one of the easiest platforms to use. 
So the question then becomes kind of why we use it. And the answer is really that right now video is king. So we know from you know, lots of studies and analytics that people want video content. Uh, millennials and Gen Z, uh, young people have clear preferences for videos. Uh, there's some great statistics here. Facebook gets 8 billion videos views every day. TikTok got 1 million per day, every day in its first year. 1 billion hours of YouTube videos are watched every day. Millennials trust videos more than they trust other forms of content. And TikTok is a little untapped still. I mean, it's been around for a couple of years, but it hasn't really gotten to the point where we're using it yet uh, on a regular basis to kind of market to the people that we want to reach in that age demographic. So there's still a, a great opportunity here for people to use TikTok. And a recent survey said that 25% of marketers plan to start using it. It doesn't have to be a complicated thing. One of the nice things about TikTok is that it's meant to be very informal and fun, which means that you can play around with the content and it doesn't have to be as polished and perfect as some other platforms might. Um, so one of the advantage of TikTok is that you can take advantage of these viral trends and kind of jump on board with them really easily because it does have this informal feel. And um, it gives you that demographic, that 18 to 24 age group. Some of the cons are that it is more fun and it's not seen as being as serious as some of the other platforms. So if that's not the vibe you're going for, that might not be good for your brand. Um, I do think, you know, one of the questions I got when I was asked to put this presentation together was whether it's a fad. And I think that it probably is a fad, but it's a fad that's been going on for a year. And I think that video isn't necessarily a fad, but TikTok itself may be because there might be, you know, the next TikTok out there. So Snapchat was popular two years ago. Vine was popular three or four years ago. I don't know that TikTok is going to be the one that's popular in two or three years from now, but it is right now and it's really easy to use. So um, that return on the investment might, might be good for you. It is a little hard to cut through the noise because there are so many people creating content, um, but it's a great way to get things out there. So a couple of examples here. Um, if you haven't tried the viral pasta recipe yet with the tomatoes and the feta cheese, it's um, something that not only did somebody share to begin with, but then other people shared their version of their video on TikTok and it just blew up. Uh, and I have to tell you that it's actually really one of the best things I've ever eaten. So it's worth doing. And I, I love the story of uh, Dogface user and his ocean spray um, ride with um, Fleetwood Mac's dream song playing because it was a great example of a really organic post. He, his car broke down and so he took his skateboard to work and wanted to chug on some juice while he was going. It wasn't meant to be a product placement, but it ended up not only going viral um, among other people who just wanted to try you know, chugging some juice while they skateboarded, but also Mick Jagger got in on it and he created a TikTok video and Ocean Spray themselves got in on it and ended up buying him a new car um, because of this video. So it can be a really fun way to, to capitalize on some of that, uh, those viral sensations. Um, and there's a link here that I'm happy to share later that are um, some of the top 100 sort of trends and videos in TikTok this past year. And it's great to just as inspiration for some things that you might wanna um, bounce ideas off of. So some of the negativity surrounding TikTok comes from a couple of different things that they have um, done that, that don't make people very happy. And one of them is privacy concerns and the other is censorship. So the reason that people are concerned over TikTok privacy and especially Trump who um, was working last year to ban TikTok in the United States was really because TikTok is owned by a Chinese company. And so they don't necessarily follow the same um, privacy laws that the United States has. They don't necessarily collect any more information from their users than any other social media company does. They're all collecting our likes, our preferences, our email addresses. Um, they have access to our phone book very often if we opt into that. But uh, whether or not they share that information has to do with privacy laws and they don't necessarily have to follow the privacy laws that some US companies do. So that's where there was a big concern over whether TikTok has bigger privacy concerns than some other US companies like Facebook would. 
I think overall, they're not necessarily any worse than any other company that we're sharing our information with. Um, it's just sort of where their parent company is located. But there are some organizations that have banned um, TikTok, like Wells Fargo, for example, doesn't allow their users to have the app. Um, and some other organizations are also discouraging people from using the app. But I think that has died down largely since uh, the new president took uh, office, and I haven't really heard too much about it since uh, last summer. The other concern that I thought was really interesting is that TikTok, and, and they've, they've definitely walked back this for sure, but uh, last year there were some leaked documents that showed that they were manipulating their algorithm to make their site show videos that were more attractive to people because they wanted it to feel sleek and beautiful and, and popular, and they didn't want to show videos of people who weren't um, good looking enough or uh, areas that might not have been, um, you know, as well off. And so they actually had a, a memo go out to some of the people that were working on their platform saying that people who were overweight, people who were obese or too thin, people with facial deformities, people who were um, posting videos in front of dilapidated housing or construction sites, would they wouldn't be banned, but they would not make it into the feed. Um, which is the For You page, which is basically like the news feed of Facebook. So their algorithm would sort of purposely not show those videos. They walked this back and they said it was never meant for US. It was always meant for other countries. And some of the things were suggestions and were never actually implemented, but it certainly did um, kind of lift the cover a little bit on some of what we're seeing on TikTok and what the the company is really going for as far as a look and feel of uh, the app, which I thought was really interesting. And we can use TikTok for just creating our own content and you know, hoping that that content gets some, some uh, views and, and perhaps goes viral, but there are options also to actually advertise on TikTok. Um, they have several different options, as you can see here, from brand takeovers to hashtag challenges and sponsored contents. So there are a lot of different options that they've developed um, for advertising actually on TikTok, but they're not cheap. So in order to advertise on TikTok, you have to have a minimum spend of $500 per campaign and if you want to take over a TikTok channel, it can cost anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 uh, for one ad buy to take over a channel. And a hashtag challenge has a flat fee of $150,000. So it's definitely something that a lot of bigger brands are doing, but it's not something that real small um, companies are necessarily able to get in right now. What's interesting about that as well though, is that what sells best on TikTok are actually products under $200. And when you think about the demographic of TikTok, that makes sense because this is a younger audience who doesn't have you know, thousands of dollars to spend on things. And so they're not um, luxury items, furniture, those types of things are not really having a great return on investment for TikTok. But what is having a return on investment are things like Elf Cosmetics and things that are a little bit lower price point, they have a much higher conversion rate um, for ads. So that's the sweet spot for TikTok advertising right now. So I think I wanted to just share with you three brands that are using TikTok and um, why they're using it. So one of the, the kind of most well-known TikTok brands that's really rocking it is Chipotle. So they're doing uh, hashtag campaigns. They're doing a lot of advertising on TikTok. And when I asked my students recently in that demographic, you know, who do you like on TikTok as far as brands, they all absolutely said Chipotle is, is what they follow, what they love. They think it's great. They're using influencers. So they're meeting the demographic where they are. So they know that their demographic is on TikTok. They're spending the money to meet them there. Um, Another brand that's taking a completely different strategy is the Washington Post. So their demographic typically skews much older and they know that those people are not on TikTok, but what they're trying to do is interest a younger audience in reading the news. And so they're taking an approach to TikTok where they're posting really fun kind of silly videos of like the, the story behind the story with things like the bachelor recap and, 
hoping to capture a new demographic that then they can kind of convert to users of their product or their paper. And then the third one was a small company who wasn't advertising on TikTok, but found during the pandemic that his, um, his small startup company for uh, chicken seasoning wasn't doing very well because there was no ability for him to really do in-person events. And so he started a TikTok uh, channel in his kitchen and ended up getting millions of views on some of his videos about how to barbecue using his spices. And his company has grown like crazy and he's been able to expand the company and expand into a new facility. So he's using it as a user. He's not necessarily paying to advertise on it, but he's getting a lot of traction, um, creating brand awareness on TikTok. So there's lots of different ways and reasons we can use it and whether or not it's worth our time and worth that return is really dependent on how much time we have and how much time we wanna spend using it. But again, it's a pretty low stake since it is easy to create and it's meant to be very informal. So we can give it a try and see, um, see how we like it. So I know that I'm limited on my time. So I wanna stop there and turn it back over to the other speakers and to Andy for um, the next piece of the discussion. Heather, that was amazing, like literally amazing. I mean, thanks for all that information. And, you know, when you said it was a fad, I was like, oh, great. I can just like, I can ride this out. I don't have to do it. It's going to be perfect. And then you went and explained everything else that's going on. It's like, oh, no, better be dialed in. So well, uh, when you said that Stacy suggested this topic a year ago, it made me realize that it is a fad, but it's it's holding on. So, uh, you know, it. I think it's still growing in popularity right now. Yeah. Uh, Sloan, I wonder if you could pick up the conversation and talk about, you know, how you do, you know, whether you use TikTok, how you use it, how it fits into your overall brand strategy when you're looking at social media. Platforms. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it definitely, I think um, Heather's point about that younger audience is certainly an important one. And, you know, you look at the Washington Post example, it, truth be told, it's one of my favorite follows personally. Um, just because it does take such a fun twist on, on the news and it's, it's very clear, you know, what, what they're up to there, but it also demonstrates, I think that there's so much room for different ways to sort of handle like how your brand is going to be on TikTok. So, you know, Washington post has, has taken an approach where they have a personality behind the account. And that, that's something that, you know, a lot of brands have done. Um, not that you have to go the humor route. Not everyone can do humor as well as Washington Post uh, TikTok guy, but um, having that kind of like very authentic connection with a person that you associate with a brand is certainly one, one path. Um, and as we're evaluating strategies for different brands, I mean, I can tell you that that conversation about a personality definitely came up uh, with with uh, one of my former uh, employers on the brand side. We, we didn't go in that direction at the end of the day, but it was something we thought a lot about. Um, but there's other approaches that some of our clients at Nine Rooftops that, that we take with them where they might not be ready to go all in on a brand account quite yet. So they're taking the approach of working with creators and we're helping to identify um, the right fit for them, the, the right accounts that, you know, we can work with. Um, and at the end of the day, it really is about driving that awareness among perhaps a bit of a different audience. So there's a lot of different ways in um, to TikTok, kind of depending on, on your level of comfort and, and what you're trying to achieve. It was, you know, the amount of money that she talked about for ad buys is significant. I mean, you're not talking about just doing like a, a startup kind of thing. So one, is that intimidating to your clients? And two, how do, you, how do you deal with that? Do you just, like, you got to buy in or do you tell them like, we're going to do something organic and not spend any money at all? I mean, it, it obviously depends on the brand, certainly. But I think in the best of all possible worlds, whenever that is available to us, you know, I think you ideally want to be thinking about three things with, with TikTok. One is, you know, what is the role of your organic and your paid content? There, there's a place for each. You know, you might not be dropping the, you know, 150K on the hashtag challenge. Um, that's, that's pretty steep for a lot of brands, but you might be taking a slightly different approach that's a, a bit of a lower spend. 
Um, but the other key piece, I think, is how you're working with creators. And when you have the ability to kind of work in those three spaces and, and to do it well, I think that's the home run. Your organic content is where you're really going to keep things going on a regular basis. You're going to be communicating with your audience, you know, very often. Um, paid is probably there to help with a slightly different objective. Um, and that could be to push a particular product or something you're launching. But the creators, I think that that's really another way in um, just to kind of make that connection with someone that in some way aligns with something that is going on with your brand, whether it's, you know, they're, they have a natural affinity for it or, um, you know, the, the type of content that they're creating is, is really a smart fit. And I think that's where there's a lot of magic in that too. Um, and certainly there's a cost to that, of course, as well, but um, that I think can, can pay some pretty big dividends. Can you just, to, before we move on, can you give us an example of a, you know, a time when you use TikTok with a client and, and how it turned out? Yeah. For better or um, for worse? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I can talk a little bit maybe about um, the US Open uh, account, which, you know, to be honest, we launched it, I, I would say, as a test. Um, we, you know, I, I had experience with the, the Chinese equivalent of the platform with Doyen, which we were active on for the US Open. And this is tennis, I should clarify, because I've worked in golf and tennis. Um, so for US Open tennis, um, we did go live in 2019 for that tournament. With the TikTok, um, we didn't put a massive effort or a ton of promotion behind it at the time, but I think it was a way for us to kind of test what might work for an audience in the space. So it was definitely a test and learn. Um, we certainly landed, I think, in the place of fun and humor, which is where I think a lot of us end up on TikTok, and that's kind of the beauty of the platform. And then as we got further into 2020 and just all of the craziness that ensued in sports, um, it became a place for a bit more emphasis for, for the brand. And the approach, at least at that time, was 100% was organic. Um, we didn't really go in on the, the paid front um, at that moment. Um, and there were just a lot of different <laughs> reasons for that relating to budgets and all that kind of good stuff that, that popped up um, in the midst of the pandemic and how that impacted the event. But it really um, took off and I, I haven't looked at the exact numbers since I, I subsequently left um, that organization, but um, you know, it was the kind of thing where people, I would say outside of the tennis space were getting exposed to our event. And that was really kind of, I think our, our mission was how do we go beyond the core tennis fan and attract a different audience uh, into our world. All right, thanks so much for sharing. That was great. Uh, now, Mr. Helia girl, I gotta tell you, when we started this out, I was scratching my head a little bit, but then when Heather gave her presentation and she explained that TikTok is actually for hot dudes doing hot things, it all kind of clicked into place for me. So tell us a little bit how you got started and, and what your inspiration is. Yeah, that really stood out to me in Heather's presentation as well. So, uh, no, hey, I mean, uh, so I'm Mr. Helia girl. Hi, everybody. Uh, but the way I got started was just, uh, you know, rewind a year ago, pandemic hit. And uh, obviously, I had my wheels, the only place I know, know is home. But, uh, it, you know, the pandemic hit, everyone was forced to be at home. And, and, uh, you know, it was, it was, world was kind of a dark place. And so for me, it was kind of uh, trying to bring some laughter, trying to bring some smiles, trying to, you know, just bring a little bit of humor into the world. And, I figured a couple of my best friends would enjoy watching the videos as well. But I, I think the platform, Heather did mention this. I think that it does such a good job at, at you don't have to be famous to get views on a video. That's, I think, the magic of, she's mentioned the For You page. You can see a video from somebody over in Colorado that you've never seen, and it might have 10 views and you're one of the 10. And then the next thing you know, it's got a hundred thousand views. And so for me, it was just, uh, you know, an organic way to kind of let off some energy, make some people smile and make some people laugh. And, and in the process, uh, you know, have a fun time doing it. You, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've also sort of turned this into a business, right? You've done some promotional videos for, for companies. Like how did, did was that your expectation when you started? And then, uh, how did it grow into that if it wasn't? 
Andy, I had no expectations going into this. Let's be clear. <laughs> okay, so, all right. All right. <laughs> so, this was not yeah. a calculated decision. All right. This was not, not at all. My <laughs> wife uh, actually thought it was a dumb decision. So no, it's actually been <laughs> wild. Uh, you know, the first uh, sponsored video that I did was uh, for a, a random Instagram company and they paid me with a t-shirt. So they sent me a t-shirt and uh so Heather, I didn't see that on your presentation. You referenced some dollar <laughs> figures, but you forgot to mention a free t-shirt as some form of payment. Uh, and so, you know, I thought that that was the coolest thing in the world though, that I got a free t-shirt from a company called Los Bagotes, which, uh, you know, is a mustache uh, company, you know, an apparel company. Yeah. So, and mm -hmm. that, you know, that's how it started was I was like, man, this is great. And then, uh, slowly but surely as you know followers grew and kind of my brand developed into what it is today uh you know i've gotten the pleasure to work with companies like gitgo uh brewmate iron city you know a bunch of just cool companies that you know they generally reach out and say hey we love what you're doing we want to be a part of it and uh you know what's your what's your fee and that's always an intimidating question when it comes up especially from somebody who has never done this before so uh, you just got to, you know, feel what your value is worth and, and hope that it's in the range. And if they say yes immediately, you know, you probably went a little too low. So. Well, so can you give us some idea of what you've learned? Like what's a, like, what, yeah. is, it, what is your fee or like how yeah, much revenue yeah. are you able to generate from this? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I, I, when I first started, I think it, you know, really depends on viewership when, you know, I first started and probably had, I don't know, maybe 30,000 followers, I, you know, it was like $300 a video. It's like, Hey, $300, I'll make a 30 second video and include you. And for me, you know, the product is just as important as the money. So for me personally, I want to make sure that the product fits my brand. Uh, but so $300 and, you know, it's gone up to, I got a smile direct club reached out and I did a commercial for them and it was $8,000. So, wow. you know, it, it definitely, it's a huge, huge array, you know, a, a pretty big uh, chasm there that you can go from 300 bucks. But I'd say on average, you know, right now we're running at about 225,000 followers and we charge, you know, anywhere between 800 and a thousand dollars a video. And it's, uh, it's awesome. It's a really great little revenue stream to be able to do something that you're passionate about. And then in the you know process also make some money off of it. So was it when you got the $8,000 check that your wife was like, yeah, this, this makes sense now or it's actually really funny. Nobody believed me that I was actually getting paid that for the longest time. So uh, until it actually hit my bank account, my wife was a firm believer uh, that it was a scam. And I had just given out my bank account information to some random person on the internet. And I, I assured her that I made sure that I did my due diligence beforehand. But, but yeah, it was uh, she, after that moment, she was, you know, a little sold on the on the idea. Yeah. Heather, why don't you had a question. Why don't you jump in and close it? Sure. I was wondering how often you do sort of sponsored content versus just your own content. Yeah. So Heather, that's a great question for me. I try to make sure that I'm not it. So first and foremost, I kind of mentioned it, any sponsored content I do, I like to make sure that it's content I would do regardless. And it just happens to have a product in it uh, that I enjoy and I, and I like doing, but anytime I do sponsored content, I like to make sure that it's, you know, if I'm going to do, eight videos in a month, I might do one or two sponsored pieces in that time because I don't want it to, you know, my audience and my viewers to feel like they're just being sold all the time. So I try to make sure that, you know, it's sprinkled in, in and out. I will say during the winter months and being a uh, Healy person that wears jean shorts, that was a little difficult to put out some content regularly. Uh, so, you know, we might have we might have slipped in a few sponsored ads here and there that, uh, you know, weren't followed up with six videos because it was negative 12 degrees outside. Fair point. <laughs> Sloan, could you put that in a little context for us just so we all understand, like, like how would a, a brand think about doing a partnership with uh, somebody like Mr. Healy? And like, how would, you know, what are the pluses and minuses of doing that kind of relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think actually what, what you just said about, you know, I, I want it to be something that I would do anyway, and the product just happens to be integrated. Those I, I think are the kinds of partnerships that, that we recommend to, to our clients um, because it, number one, it's gonna perform better. It, it's in line with expectations of that person's audience. Um, but, you know, number, number two is, you know, it, it's just, it's, 
it's going to be a stronger fit. And hopefully it's even something that can turn into a bigger relationship that goes beyond, you know, even just the one post um, that doesn't happen every time, but it certainly can. So I think as we're making recommendations to, to our clients, you know, we're, we're looking at, at creators or influencers at all different levels, be it a more of a micro level or even more of a macro level where we know that the fee is going to be higher but the, the end goal is, is always going to be kind of the, the same, you know, to kind of get that exposure that really feels like it belongs there. So, you know, we try not to be too prescriptive, even as we're getting into like working with an influencer, you know, we'll, we'll provide whatever brand standards or parameters, you know, that, that we need to, of course. But, um, you know, we, we usually want things to kind of feel like it's in the voice of, of the creator. You, Heather, you talked about like how to create a TikTok. Like, so now we all know how to do it, like the, the mechanics of it. But can you talk a little bit about like the, you know, the, the finding those moments of inspiration and what separates somebody like uh, Mr. Helia Girl versus, uh, you know, the rest of us who are keeping our TikToks on private? You know, I think that's that sort of magic fairy dust that makes something get popular. I don't, I don't know that we know exactly what separates, you know, I have a million friends out there posting TikTok videos that nobody watches except probably them and their parents maybe, but you know, what is that magic formula to get popular? And I think, you know, being real and being fun and um, having that sense of humor certainly appeals to more people. Sometimes it's just the look of the draw where somebody shares something you did and, and it gets a huge, um, you know, a wide net that's cast. Um, but I don't know if I knew exactly what makes things go viral and popular, then we would all be doing that every time, right? <laughs> Yeah. It's a mustache, Heather. It's a oh, mustache. That's, so. that's it. Okay. <laughs> that's what it does. Wait, I think jean shorts is always the answer. <laughs> yep. Are they not? I thought they were jorts, but is that that's not a thing? Or? No, they're jorts. You're right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Do think um, those, authenticity is important. I mean, I think that, you know, if people can really see through the kind of the celebrity endorsements where it's just very obvious that they're doing it to get paid um, versus, you know, people like Connor who are kind of doing their thing because it's their thing. And we just were drawn to that. So I think that, you know, number one, keeping it authentic is important. So um, Mr. Healy girl, when you, when you started out, at what point did you realize this was a thing? Like when did it take off? And, and can you also, um, one of the questions was, is this your full-time job? Maybe you could talk about what your, your day job is. Yeah, this is not my full-time job. So I'm a financial analyst uh, that I work for Comcast Business. So that is my full-time job. I'm a numbers guy, but I also like Keelan on the side. It's just, you know, a favorite pastime of mine. Uh, but yeah, for me, you know, outside of my full-time job, when I started to find this hot financial dude doing hot financial things, that might be my new uh, slogan. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> for me, I, I noticed uh, that this was, you know, a little bit bigger was probably, uh, you know, maybe a month into it. I think I got my first uh, viral video and viral being, you know, heavily air quoted there. Cause it was like 10,000 views. And I remember talking to my, uh, my brother at the time who helps me film a lot of my videos. And I was like, Hey, what, before this video happened, I was like, Hey, what's famous? You know, what, do, what, do, what are we, what are we going to define as famous here? He's like 10,000 views. You get 10,000 views. You're going to be famous. And we hit 10,000 views on a video. And I was like, Hey man, I'm famous. And, uh, he then insisted that he meant a hundred thousand views. And then we hit a hundred thousand views and there was a hundred thousand followers. We hit that. And I'm just not allowed to be famous in his eyes. So we will never be there. But I think, you know, you get that one for me, it's, it's putting out steady content and, you know, then building that following base. And then to Heather's point, you just find maybe a secret sauce or something special. I think what TikTok does a great job at is, and she mentioned it, is bringing music uh, to the forefront of videos. And I think music does such a great job at kind of transcending boundaries and, you know, getting into, you know, pulling on nostalgia if you're using older music. And so I think that the combination of that, you know, really helps someone be successful. And then, you know, you get that good, that one good, nice video that, you know, kind of blows up. And from there, you know, you can kind of build a steady following. What was that one video that went to 10,000 and why did that one get so much traction? I, you know, I can't tell you anything special, but I know exactly what video was. Uh, the song was St. Elmo's Fire, which is just a pure heater. Let's, you know, appreciate that. But uh, 
I was just, you know, it, to be honest, I didn't even know how to use the app all that well when I first started either. So like you can hear like some background noise where it's like my wife's filming the video and she says go and <laughs> you can hear. It. So, I, you know, there's nothing special other than I think, you know, the song was great. The moves were on point, obviously. You can't, you know, and and uh, the mullet was starting to come in a little bit as well. So I think there's just the culmination of all that. And then, you know, it, it got on the, the right algorithm, I guess. But nothing special other than, you know, those few things. So the chat is blowing up, but I, I want to get to some of the questions on there. Uh, actually, one of my former students and assistants, uh, Anthony Sunita. Anthony, do you want to ask your question on your own? Let's see if you can unmute. You should be able to unmute. Uh, yeah, I, I can do that. Hi, Andy. Hi, Heather. Um, nice to see you guys all again. Um, so uh, I work for California University of Pennsylvania. Don't hold it against me, guys. And um, it's a um, we've been bouncing around the TikTok idea for a better part of a year now um, as an admissions tool. And so the big concern we've had is um, figuring out how to make uh, good content that is engaging to the demographic of practically high school students, uh, specifically 16, 18 year olds, without it feeling like it's uh, lame, forced, uh, a bunch of 30 plus to 40 plus is creating content without understanding the concept of it. Uh, how, how do you, and specifically the Connor, how do you create content uh, that feels uh, genuine and without also feeling um, like it's overdone or overblown? Is it, was it a lot of trial of error or uh, anything of that? Yeah, I think, you know, it goes back to what everyone has been saying. And first and foremost, you have to be genuine, right? It, I think that especially, you know, Gen Z, millennial, like people can just cut through and eat through anyone who's not authentic, if you're not bringing an authentic self. So I think that that's super important. And then I, I will tell you that a lot of, you know, organic good video ideas just came from collaboration. So, you know, I'm, I, I like to think that I come up with all my, my own ideas and all the best ideas are mine, but they're really not, you know, it works with, um, if it's working with a, a company, you know, collaborating with, you know, their marketing director, if it's coming up with a, a, the next video, it's talking with my friends, talking with, uh, you know, people that I think are watching the videos and then my audience. So, you know, in your case, I think that, you know, having, you know, just collaborating with some young, young people of that age, you know, trying to figure out what, what could be funny because, you know, they know. And so that's, I, I would say those two big things being authentic and then collaboration, I think are, are super key when you're trying to come up with content, uh, you know, especially starting off. Sloan, could you jump in on that too? Cause I think you probably. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, my biggest piece of advice to anyone that's thinking about getting involved in, in TikTok is to spend a lot of time in the app and really kind of get familiar, like get a sense of what people in your target audience are looking at, what are the things that are trending for them. And I think one of the biggest eye openers for me, because I, I think I went into it with, and this, this might have been kind of the assumption that I had from the content we were creating for the, the China market was like, everything had to be super funny. And like, sometimes when you try to force funny, it just doesn't work. Um, so I've been actually just amazed at some of the content that I'm seeing that frankly isn't funny. Like I'm, I'm amazed, like the New York Times had an article this week about how like book talk, I'm like books. I'm like, why are people <laughs> looking at books on TikTok? Oh, yeah. But there's, there are all these books from years ago that are, are now like landing in the Times bestsellers list because of reviews that are popping up on the platform. And I, I'm just, I'm impressed with that. Um, and so, I, you know, I would encourage you, I think, to look at it through that lens too. Like, it doesn't necessarily have to be funny. Like, is there something that's maybe even more educational, but done in that TikTok kind of way, you know? Washington Post educates you, but it, it's funny um, that we have a, a lot of cleaning clients we work with at our agency, and I'm amazed at the cleaning community that's there. And in, in some ways, it reminds me of the early days of Twitter. This is going to date me a little bit for the, the Gen Z folks out there, but I was on Twitter back in the day. And the thing I always loved about it was that 
any passion you had, whatever it was, there was a group of people out there on Twitter that were talking about it. And I think it's the same thing with TikTok. So, you know, I would just encourage you from a university admissions perspective to like, you know, just explore and, and think bigger than, than just the, the funny aspect. Thanks, Sloan. I appreciate that. Uh, Kate Mercier, Mercier, Mercier has a question about uh, lives. Kate, do you want to ask it? Might be best for Heather. Ah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just didn't know. I've, I've only, I've started a TikTok this year and I just had a post kind of blow up. Um, I had 250,000 views in uh, 24 hours and I, wow. I was wondering how, how long it can be before I can do lives. I only have 250 followers, so I think it might be a long time. And what, before you, before we get an answer, what was the video like? What made it take off? Do you have an idea? It, I'm, almost all of my TikTok is fandom related, and it was just a picture of Chris Evans. <laughs> Heather, what do you, like, do you know, like, what's yeah. the deal with live and lives? Yeah, we talked about it in the chat a little bit. I think it's a thousand uh, followers before you can go live. But I did, um, there do seem to be some hacks a little bit. So um, I'll, I'll post that in the chat and, and there may be a way around it. Could you also talk about, because the, the other questions come up has been about Reels versus TikTok. And it, Reels is Instagram, right? Yes. Yeah. So Sloan, can you like, what's the difference? Like is one better than the other? They're kind of very similar, but. This, this is coming up, I think a lot with some of our clients and, and actually it goes back to what Heather was talking about, like is TikTok a fad? So I think my, my advice there is like the idea of, of just very like kind of lo-fi, low production. And I mean that not in a bad way, <laughs> low production, but that style of short form video, that style of storytelling, it's not going away. Like it's, it's here, it's here to stay whether you're consuming that on TikTok or Instagram Reels or something else that's invented, it's, it's here, it's connecting with people. Um, I, there's definitely, I think, from a functionality perspective, um, creatively, I think TikTok for sure has a leg up on Instagram Reels at the moment. But I think for some brands, the idea of standing up an entirely new social channel, even though it, it it's not super difficult to make content there. I think that that can be intimidating. And for them to say, you know what, I've already got a presence on Instagram. I'm going to dive into reels. For some of them, I think that is more palatable and it still is getting at um, that younger audience. It, it is people on Instagram who are using the platform in a different way than other audiences might be who are gravitating more toward the feed or stories um, or whatever it might be. That, that's coming next, um, but it, it still is that short form story. It, that's really at the heart of, of Reels, even though there's you know some differences in the functionality. Yeah, some of the main differences are uh, the time. So Instagram Reels are typically 30 seconds, whereas TikToks are uh, 60 seconds, which is a, you know, a big difference. And then some other functionality, especially the limitations on business accounts with Instagram. So right now, some of the real limitations for Instagram are, you know, they, they don't often allow music uh, with business accounts. There aren't analytics with business accounts uh, or any accounts for uh, reels on Instagram. And um, they don't allow advertising on reels for Instagram. So right now, Instagram reels are sort of, uh, you know, TikTok is superior in a lot of ways, but, um, to Sloan's point, if you already have a presence on Instagram and that's where your users are and your followers are, then it, certainly that may be a better option for you. And I think one, one thing I'll just add there is there's definitely, I think, a lot of brands that are repurposing TikTok and just dropping it into Reels. It's something I would advise against. Um, you know, Instagram is owned by Facebook. It's, they've got some of the most sophisticated algorithms that are out there. And it's something that, you know, they are picking up on and, you know, you, you do need to really be creating for each, each platform. Um, I know that's not the convenient way, way of working, but you always want to be thinking about each platform individually. So as we're wrapping up here, I got 
two final questions for uh, Mr. Helia Girl. The uh, one, are you just on TikTok or do you do you go into any other brands? Are you doing anything off of social media altogether? Has this helped like created other revenue streams for you outside of social? Yeah, so uh, I'm not only am I on TikTok, but I'm also on Instagram and, you know, I utilize Reels. and um, They are very, you know, very similar, but, you know, slightly different and all in the same note there. But I will say that, uh, you know, Instagram's nice in that a lot of, you know, as a creator, a lot of brands, if they are asking to do sponsored advertisements, uh, they do care about Instagram following more than TikTok following because it's, you know, a little easier to get a TikTok following than Instagram following. So it's worth calling that out. Um, and then as well, I was able to uh, kind of launch some merch. So we sell uh, fanny packs. You know, they, they've they been going off the shelves, Andy. You can't can't stock them uh, quick enough. Those and between those and the crop top muffin top won't stop shirts. You know, it's really, uh, they you can't, we just can't keep it in stock. So, you know, we've been able to uh, drive actually, you know, a fair amount of revenue just from merchandise sales as well. So between that and, and Instagram, that's kind of where I'm, I'm trying to keep just those, those three going. So, and, you know, and Etsy and Instagram and TikTok haven't delved into the vlog vlog world yet on YouTube, but who knows, maybe sooner or later. The other big question that came up for you a while back that I didn't get to was uh, people want to know how you pick your music. Uh, it's right from the heart, you know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> That's an easy uh, you know, for me, I, I grew up with this, uh, you know, a lot of nineties music, a lot of, uh, early eighties, late eighties. And I, I just think for me, I, music is such like big part of my life. And it was a big part of my childhood. And, and for me, I, I think, you know, what song is going to make people stop and listen. And, you know, maybe it's something they haven't heard in a while. And, you know, maybe it's something they're like, man, I forgot it. And, you know, the video just comes after that. But I think that, you know, grabbing their attention in the first couple seconds is such a big, big part of content creation. And I think music does such a great job with that. So I always, you know, it's funny. I, when I go through my drafts, so I've got, you know, maybe 200 drafts in my TikTok videos. I have a, a song picked out and then I have like two words next to it describing what I think the video should look like. So I might have, you know, something by Fergie, you know, London Bridges, and it'll just say like, drop it low. And that's it. That's, you know, how I get my inspiration. But I always make sure I, I start with a song and then work from there. All right. So in the, the lightning round here, just to, to round this out, uh, to come back to sort of the end of Heather's presentation, and Emily had this question a while back, just for all three of the panelists in like 10 seconds, uh, should should people TikTok or, or not? Uh, Heather? Um, I think you should at least be on it to see what's there. Whether you create your own content is something that it, you could dip your toe in for fun, um, but at least you know, get an account, log in and look at the, you know, the feed and see what's trending. That's important. Okay. Sloan, to TikTok or not? Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more, like get in there, check it out. Even if you ultimately decide that it's not for you, it is fascinating, I think, to see how different what works there versus other social platforms that you might be on. Like a lot of the no-nos that we might have for Facebook, like, you know, don't use audio, like no one's got the audio on, like it's completely the opposite in, in TikTok. So there's some interesting, I think just broader trends happening there from a media perspective. So it, it's helpful to, to see that. All right, Mr. Healy, you get the final word to TikTok or not? No, they shouldn't. <laughs> Stay <laughs> no, out of it. That's it, it's perfect. <laughs> Of course they should. I think everyone should be on it. And, you know, someone just mentioned in the comments, like some half of the music on the radio now is just because of TikTok trends. So I think everyone should be on the on the platform. Check it out. And honestly, don't let the the video creation aspect of it scare you. It's so simple. I think that the video uh, just the video filming software on it by itself is some of the best. It's better than just the iPhone camera software. So even if you just want to film a random video, I think it's the platform to do it on. So absolutely. 
All right. Well, thanks again to our panelists. This was an amazing discussion. We could have gone on so much longer. It was really, uh, you know, fascinating and entertaining. Uh, big thanks to Stacey Federoff again for putting this together. And people, this is the kind of stuff she will bring to you if you hire her. So please be sure to check out her LinkedIn. She put in the chat. And uh, thanks to our friends at PRSA for uh, helping us get out the word and spread the, the word. I, I noticed some people came in from around the country, so that was great too. So thanks to everyone. Um, go and, uh, you know, it was, it was unanimous. Yes, you should TikTok. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks, thanks Andy. Thank you. Bye-bye.